Hello and welcome to I'd Like to Know. My name is C.A. Murray, and after a bit of an absence, it is my privilege and pleasure to be back with my pastor, my mentor, my friend, Pastor Stephen Bohr, president and founder of this ministry. Pastor, always good to work with you. Good to be back in the chair with you. You have no idea how much we missed you. <laughs> um, CA is a real blessing to our ministry, and when he's not around, it's not the same. Oh, praise the Lord. As you can see, the rumors are true. Yes, we do like each other here at Secrets Unsealed. We enjoy each other's company. We socialize together outside of ministry, and uh, we have a good time in the Lord. Amen. This program is one of our favorites because it gives us a chance to study the Word of God, but also to know those things that are on your heart, the questions that you may have concerning your faith, your faith walk from the Bible. We like to get the questions. We like to answer the questions, and we have a good time in doing so. We make you this promise, as we always do, that if an answer can be found from the Word of God, we will find that answer and give you only what the Word of God has to say. We are rather late in the history of this world. In fact, too late to be bantering about men's opinions. We want to know the Word of the Lord, and we want to get a word from the Lord. So we promise to give you that word from the Lord, if indeed it can be found. Should you like to get in on the fun, we encourage you to do so. You can write us at tv at sumtv.org. That is tv at sumtv.org. As you can well imagine, the list of questions is rather long. So if you don't hear your question in the first week or two after you send it in, we're going to get to it. We promise you we will get to it. We don't like to rush through questions. Our, 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 our goal is not speed. Our goal is accuracy from the Word of God. So we may get through one question, uh, two, three questions per program. It all depends on the question. So we'll get to it, we promise you. But um, uh, hold fast, we are coming, <laughs> and we will get to your question. Pastor, if you would ask the Lord to be with us, we'll launch out in today's program. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne, and we do so reverently and humbly through the merits and the power of Christ. We ask that uh, you will be with us as we do our best to answer these questions. We ask that it will be a blessing for those who are watching this program, and uh, we just ask that you will give us your wisdom as we work today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor, just before we go into this week's program, and I know this question is something that you have dealt with, and I've heard you speak on this subject, uh, so I know you're well-versed on it. But last week uh, on the program, there was a question that came in from a, a person who, who titles his uh, email, Who is that guy? It was a nine-part question, and we really didn't have time to, to work our way through all nine parts. It was quite long. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the, the origins of the Bible, the canonization of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, where did we get the Bible from? How did it come through in this form? What is apocryphal? What is pseudepigraphal? What is canon? Uh, uh, and so we, we didn't, it would just take so long. What this person really needs is to do a short study on the history of the Bible. I know there's a great book called How We Got the Bible. It's in my library. Don't remember who wrote it, but perhaps the person can look it up. Maybe you know of, of some books that may give him some, some information on that also. But we weren't able to take, tackle such a big question, you know, in the time that was allotted to us. I, of course, was not able to be here for that program. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some things, though, however, that I think that uh, we could address uh -huh. concerning the several questions that this individual asked. I think it's nine questions. Yeah, there were nine. Uh, how much did you cover of the questions that he asked? We, did, we didn't actually get to we, we did three questions last week. And since this, we had like a minute left and there was so much here, we, we didn't cover it at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. can, can we maybe just uh, say a few things sure. about uh, the canonization? Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say that uh, the the uh, canonization of Scripture is not something that happened in a point of time. Precisely. It actually was a process, mm -hmm. a process of centuries. Uh, regarding the Old Testament, the Old Testament uh, canon was pretty much settled by the uh, Council of Jamnia in 135 Jamnia. AD. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but even before that, uh, you know, the canon of the Old Testament was pretty much settled. There's not a lot of dispute about the canon of the Old Testament. Yes. Uh, there, you know, the last three books that were to be included in the canon, of course, were uh, the book of Esther, 
uh, mainly because the name of God is not mentioned not there. there. Correct. Uh, the word of Song of Songs, because it, it sounded a little bit too romantic to yes. be in the Bible, mm -hmm. to use a, a mild term. <laughs> and uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, because it was so pessimistic. You yes. know, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Mm -hmm. So those were the last books to be included. Uh, but the, the canon was pretty much settled in the times of Christ. Yes. Uh, you know, Jesus referred to the two por three por portions of the Old Testament uh, when he talked to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he mm -hmm. says, beginning in the, uh, the, you know, beginning with Moses. Yes. That's the five books of Moses. Mm -hmm. And all the prophets. And all the prophets, correct. He expounded to them in all the scriptures mm -hmm. the things concerning himself. Yes. So that's the Torah, the Nebiim, mm -hmm. and the Kethubim. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was three parts yes. to the canon uh, in the days of Christ, yes. the Old Testament canon. Now, with regards to the New Testament canon, um, it was pretty much settled um, in apostolic times. Yes. You know, there was some discussion in the period of the church fathers. You know, Origen, who was known for being very original, yes. had some questions about some of the 27 books in the canon. But, um, but really, uh, the New Testament canon was pretty much settled uh, in apostolic times, yes. in early post-apostolic times. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of dispute about which books uh, should uh, be in the New Testament. Yes. Uh, regarding Luther, <laughs> there were certain books that Luther did well, not Luther like. Luther had issues with, yes. <laughs> now, what, what, what people don't realize is that uh, Luther translated those books mm -hmm. that he didn't particularly care for um, in the in the uh, Bible that he published in 1522. Yes. He put them at the end of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And those books were um, the book of Hebrews, um, I suppose it's because he didn't really understand the sanctuary service. Um, the book is tremendously Christ-centered. Oh, very much so. I mean, but, but probably he did really wasn't into studying the sanctuary. Um, I don't know exactly the reason why he did not like Hebrews. Uh, he had issues with James. Well, we know, and we know uh, why. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, yeah. because Luther was struggling against the idea that man could work his way to heaven. Precisely. That was his, his and so, issue. And so James speaks a lot about works. In mm -hmm. fact, chapter 2 says that Abraham was justified no, not only by faith, but by works by also. Works, yes. yes. And Rahab also. Mm -hmm. And so Luther, that just wouldn't fit. But we need to understand Luther within the context of what he was fighting against. Precisely, where he came from. Uh, you know, if background. he was living today, mm -hmm. he would probably uh, have a different view of James. Mm -hmm. uh, he also did not like Revelation. Uh-huh. Because all he could see in there was beasts and mysterious numbers and things like that. So he would, could not really find Christ in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. I believe that today he would look at it differently. Yes. And then he also had issues with the book of, um, with the book of Jude. Uh, it's kind of a little strange book mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main thing is that to determine whether a book belonged to uh, the canon, was that all of the books would be in harmony. There would be no contradiction between Precisely. what one book says and another book says. Precisely. And uh, it was guided by God, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. divinely guided by God, which yes. books should be in the Old Testament and which books should be in the New yes. Testament. I think your point is very well taken. Uh, we have to allow God the ability, uh, realize the ability to, to, to take care of his own books. Um, if they did not have a certain flavor. And if you, if, you, if you read the Apocrypha, you begin to run into some things mm -hmm. that just don't sound like the rest of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, don't want to go into all of that, but it, it just doesn't sound like that. Um, I think your point for, uh, about Luther is well taken. Given where he was coming from, given what he was trying to free himself from, mm -hmm. given the, the, the life he lived, anything that smacked of or even smelled of works Mm -hmm. He was going to re reject. Right. Um, Hebrews a sort of is, it puts Christ at the pinnacle of everything, um, and for some reason he didn't work his way through all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you had things going on in the Old Testament, but Christ is the summation, the pinnacle of all of that. He didn't see that, and of course, Revelation, Christ is not sitting on the surface. You got to dig a little bit, right, to find Christ. He is there. He is thoroughly there, but he's not lying on the ground to pick up, you got you to gotta scrape a little bit to get down to him. Right. Uh, and, and Luther wasn't, you know, Luther was not the be all and end all of the Protestant Reformation. He was a shining star. He was a great light. He was a, a, a very strong reformer. But it didn't stop with Luther. There were other individuals 
who brought their own particular uh, flavor to it and added to it also. So it doesn't stop with Luther. Uh, Luther was just a very important part, like Martin Luther King in the, in the Civil Rights mm -hmm. Movement. It wasn't all Martin Luther King. He was a shining light, but there were others who added to it all. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you look at the Apocrypha, uh, the Apocrypha had their origin mainly in the intertestamental period. Correct. Uh, long after the Old Testament uh, period ended. Mm -hmm. You know, the book of Malachi is about 425 B.C., uh -huh. which is still within the parameters of the Old Testament before the intertestamental period. Correct. But in the intertestamental period, you have wild books, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, that, that contradict many of the things that are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. One example is, uh, you know, the, the author of uh, the books of Maccabees. Yes. You know, he says in his book, uh, you know, I've written to the best of my recollection, I'm paraphrasing, if anybody can find anything that's not particularly accurate, let me know. You know, well, that doesn't particularly sound like the inspired scripture. No, no. And, and there's other things in the Apocrypha that clearly show that uh, these books should not be included in the canon because they mm -hmm. contradict some things that are already in the accepted canon. Mm -hmm. I think the, the one thing that, that uh, we should leave with this this. Uh, this writer is the fact that it wasn't a bunch of people went in a room and came out and said, this is a canon. Right. You know, it happened over a period of time. We believe as guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And right. it, it was settled over a period of time. Books containing the same information, having the same flavor, uh, agreeing with each other, as opposed to some people went into a room, closed the door and came out and said, here it, it is. is. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah we received a vision. <laughs> <laughs> These are the books that belong to the Bible. It was a process. They were very meticulous and very careful. Mm -hmm. You know, in order to do things right, you have to do them slowly, Correct. but surely. Correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's so many questions in this uh, one question. Yes. That it's difficult to address them all. But um, I hope that this person, you know, you don't really have to, we don't have to give a recommendation here as far as books are concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, the person can Google and, you know, how yeah. did we get the Bible mm -hmm. and find an abundance of information as to books that are available very and true. articles that have been, been written and so on. You know, the uh, Google makes it very easy to do research these days. Yeah, it makes anybody a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> we sure thank does. The Lord for that. <laughs> we want to move into this question because I know this is something that you've given study on and we've talked about this before. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, this is uh, Lewis uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm reading this question from. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Question, I'd like to know when and why the earth was, was without form and void. Was it after creation or before? And where did the waters come from in verse 2? Was it from creation by God? Well, of course, this, this is um, uh, a question about, about the beginnings. Was it after creation or before, well, it, it was at creation. And that's when the Bible picks up the, the, the story. Mm -hmm. um, um, when and why um, was the earth without form and void? So maybe you want to launch into that. Yeah. yeah, the big question is, um, how long was this planet here before creation week? Mm -hmm. I think that might be the gist of this question. And there are two views. One view is that it was very possible that this planet was here for a long period of time before creation week. Mm -hmm. The other idea is that the planet itself was created as God was about to begin creation week. Mm -hmm. I personally think on the basis of the fourth commandment that uh, this earth was made and then immediately God began, began creation week. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that uh, is the fourth commandment the fourth commandment of God's law, uh, Genesis, I mean, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. And before we read uh, that text, we need to read Genesis 1, 1 and 2 again. Okay. Uh, it says there in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it continues saying, the earth was without form and void. Mm -hmm. Now, did God create the heavens and the earth within the parameters of the, of the seven days of creation? The fourth commandment seems to indicate so. Yes. 
because it says there in Exodus chapter 20, and uh, let's read verse 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. So was the creation of the heavens and the earth within the parameters of the six days? Yes. Yes, it says, in six days God made the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I think that the Bible shares is that um, God on the first day of the week created the planet and then immediately He began uh, by, by making the light or creating the light. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there are others who believe that this planet was here probably for millions of years before creation week. And you know, even though there are people to, who object to what I'm going to say, uh, I don't see that there's an issue. Let's suppose that the planet was here uh, for 10 million years before creation week, but it had no life. It was without form and void. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't make any difference. Yeah. The difference is that we believe that creation week took place about 6,000 years ago. Right. And that uh, God made everything during that period of seven days. Yeah. Whether the planet was here long before that, yeah. as a planet, you know, it's like all the stars. They've been there who, who knows how long. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let me, let me just give an illustration of, uh, you know, how this works. Let's suppose that, uh, you know, Mars is a desolate uh, planet. Let's just suppose that Mars has been there for 10 million years. And suddenly God says, you know what, I think that uh, we're going to, uh, uh, in seven days, we're going to fix up Mars yeah. so that it can sustain life. Would we have a problem with that? No. No problem at all no. that, it, that it was there 10 million years. Mm -hmm. The issue is whether, whether creation week yes. took place in recent yeah. times. That's, that's the key. And sometimes this, this, this idea of, of an, an earth undeveloped sitting around 10 million years is, is an attempt to harmonize it with what they see as science mm -hmm. that right. gives you those, those, those long years. But and I think your point is well taken. That's not the key. That's not the crux, the crux of the issue. The issue is, did God create the world as we know it in six literal days? That's the key. And once you settle that, there's, there's no argument. There's no yeah. dissonance. It, it, it flows nicely. And a short chronology. Precisely. In other words, there are, you know, theistic evolutionists and, uh, you know, those who believe in progressive creation mm -hmm. that say, well, you know, um, creation of, it took place maybe millions of years ago. Yes. Uh, we cannot believe that because it goes against the idea in Genesis that creation was done in seven days. It actually is an attack, on, an indirect attack on the Sabbath. It is. It is. It is. Because if you, if you pull out those six literal days, you cannot have a Sabbath. Correct. Because the Sabbath is a literal day. Right. So um, it's, it's one or the other. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> well said, yeah. Pastor. Well done. All right. Um, this is from Shogun. And um, this deals with, well, let me just read the question. I'm a firm believer and will never change that. I do want to know what uh, Stephen Bohr has to say about, the, about how Gilgamesh, not sure the spelling, and the Bible have some things in common. And since Gilgamesh was much earlier, how this relates. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, she's talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh epic, which sure. is a flood story, mm -hmm. a Babylonian flood story, uh -huh. not from not Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar's time, but very early Babylon, Tower yes. of Babel Babylon. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, there's three possibilities. One possibility is that the Bible borrowed from Gilgamesh. <laughs> and that's what uh, many scholars who do not believe in the inspiration of the Bible would say. Mm -hmm. Others say that uh, Gilgamesh bar borrowed from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's too many discrepancies. That's not going to work. The Bible is later. Yes. So the answer is very simple. They both draw from an original source. And um, the reason why they're different is because in the process of time, stories get bent out of shape. Precisely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, it has many similarities to the biblical story because it's mm -hmm. going back to the original event. There Correct. was a flood mm -hmm. and the story was passed on. Mm -hmm. But as the story is passed on, it's embellished, they mm -hmm. add to it, they change it, they mm -hmm. take away. Mm -hmm. But the source that we can trust 
is the Bible story. It's the Bible source. Because right. it's not sensational. You know, it's not sensational like uh, like the story of Ep Epic of Gilgamesh that uh, the gods sent the flood because they couldn't sleep because the people on earth were making too much noise. You know, this <laughs> ridiculous ideas. <laughs> you know, that is part of what... Um, Garrett Cornelius Burkhauer calls the ontological argument for the existence of God. He says in all cultures in the world, there, there are usually three figures. There is a creator figure, a destroyer figure, which we call a devil, and a mm -hmm. redeemer figure. And all, all cultures have that. Mm -hmm. they've, they've sort of twisted it and malleated it and, 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 and sort of turned it around, but all cultures have it. So it, it, there must be a common source from which all of those cultures sure. borrowed. So that is an argument for, a, it's a rational argument for the existence of God. In, in other words, if you don't have a Bible, you can still prove the existence of God by looking at the fact that everybody's got a God conscious. Mm -hmm. All cultures have it. They, yes. they give it different names. They arrive at it by different routes, but they all have it. So there must have been a common reality mm -hmm. somewhere in history, and Gilgamesh tends to fall in that. Almost all cultures have a yep. flood story yep. or a flood-ish story. Uh, so this, again, uh, proves that there was a common source, and that, of course, is, is, is God the Father. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, so it, it, it does work. It's one of the arguments in favor of a global flood. Precisely. Because, because the stories that are held by many different cultures are all over the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if it was a local mm -hmm. flood, you would expect maybe if it was in India, you would have an Indian story about the flood. Precisely. But the, the flood stories in all these ancient cultures are actually uh, all over the world. Precisely. And mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. is a strong argument that there was an original there event. New, yes, yes, yes. Uh, very good. Um, good question. And uh, uh, hopefully we have, we have dealt with it fairly. Um, Jamie Mar Martin Martinez is our next question. I have a couple of people. Uh, um, I have a question. Can people make it in the final judgment while they are still drinking coffee and struggling to overcome coffee? At that moment, if we have not overcome it, uh, will that sin keep us from entering? Please help me with this question. Uh, I'm struggling with this. Now, before I turn it over to you, I, this is what I want to say. The issue is not coffee. Uh -huh. Coffee is a symptom of a larger issue. To my mind, the issue is obedience to the will and way of God. Known light. Precisely. You, for him, it's coffee. For someone else, it may be something else. But the issue is, are we going to obey God? Um, are we going to uh, uh, follow his directives? And disobedience to any one of those directives can keep you out of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So coffee is just a symptom of a larger problem. The right. uh, problem is not coffee. Uh, you're, it, it, his issue is coffee, but there's a bigger problem uh, at foot. And of course, it all depends on whether the person is justifying the drinking of coffee or whether the person is really sincerely sorry that they have this habit mm. and they are struggling and longing for the God, for God to deliver them yes. from uh, the consumption of coffee or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have the story of my grandfather, um, my dad's dad. Uh, he had a terrible problem uh, with smoking. Mm. And, uh, you know, he came to an evangelistic crusade drunk. I, I'm not going to tell the whole story. And, uh, you know, he came to the Lord. He accepted the Adventist message, became a deacon in the church. Praise God. And, um, you know, he had this, this issue with smoking. Uh, he smoked a lot. And uh, in the morning, as the day began, he would uh, take his cigarette pack and he would say, I hate this. I hate this habit. And there was a cornfield next to the, uh, next to the house where they lived. He would take the pack of cigarettes and he would heave it as hard as he could into the rose of corn. corn yeah. Guess what he was doing just a short while later? Out in that row of corn. He was on his hands it. and yeah. knees looking for the back <laughs> of cigarettes. Uh, but praise the Lord, he had the right attitude. He <laughs> wasn't justifying smoking. Yes. But he was struggling. He wanted to leave the habit of smoking because he knew it was mm -hmm. against the Lord's will. Mm -hmm. And the Lord eventually gave him the victory. Praise God. So it, the question is, are you justifying the drinking of coffee mm -hmm. or are you struggling with coffee or whatever other besetment mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a similar story in my very first church. Uh, my, my head deacon 
was a smoker. And somebody came, past your, your deacon's a smoker. Uh, so I went to his house and, and talked to him. He said, yeah, I have, a, I have. And he really wanted to give it up. Uh, he'd throw the pack away and leave a couple in his drawer, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. But he, he eventually got, got the victory. It wasn't easy. He had to struggle with it. Uh, and he struggled with it for years, but he, he did get the victory. So uh, two things come to mind. One, uh, God is able to free us from whatever problem we Amen. fall into or, or walk into. And, and, and because you fail one time, don't give up. Righteous man falls seven times, get back up and keeps on walking. Right. So, so even if you have um, fallen, I like 1 John 1, 7. Uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship Amen. and the blood of Christ cleanses us, you know, uh, 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 from sin. So keep walking step by step, as, as they say in Spanish, poco a poco, little by little. No, right. Just keep on walking and the Lord will give you the victory. You know, the Bible does not say I can do most things <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. Well or said. I can do some things yes. through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. It says, I can do all things okay. through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, you know, some people say, well, the human, you know, our human sinful nature is just so powerful that there are certain things that we can't give up. Mm -hmm. What they're really saying is that God is not strong. That's they're what not saying mean. man is weak. Yeah. They're saying God isn't strong enough mm -hmm. to give you the victory if you commit your ways to him. Yes, yes. You know, I, I was talking with my doctor the other day. Um, and, and one of the things we're talking about is medicine today is, 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 is so con, uh, constructed. It's, it's not really designed to get you to change. It's designed to medicate you while you right. keep on doing what you're doing. You know, yeah. if, you, if you're eating a lot of meat and you, you've got high cholesterol and your, your thing is bad, well, we give you a pill to just don't stop eating meat. Just take this pill yeah. uh, kind of thing. So the idea of victory is not really part of, of medicine anymore. But the idea of victory is central to the walk of the Christian. You know, I had an uncle uh, who passed away a while back and uh, he was talking to my mom one day and he said, you know, in all the years I've been practicing psychiatry, I haven't healed a single person. And my wife and my mom says to him, well, why, why you, what, what do people want? He says, well, uh, you know, people want uh, me to uh, help them feel better and continue living the way they are. Precisely. Well, Precisely. time is about up, folks. So thank you for your questions. We appreciate them. God bless, and we hope to see you next time in our program, I'd Like to Know.